Ooh, you hear it. You hear the theme. How frustrating is it that they put that tutorial there now, given this was right after? The core's a bit grim, no? Man, he's so cool. Well, doesn't matter. Who are you? Vincent Valentine. I'm security. Uh, security vampire. Why are you here? Be brief. Your terminal. Mm -hmm. Authorization at least. Oh, great. <laughs> Though you're clearly not Murasaki, explain yourself. Ah, uh, it's a bit of a long story, and we'd love to tell you all about it. But there's something we really need to look up first. Can't go letting our foe win the information war, eh? Your foe? And who might that be? Gotta stick with the original. A man who many people, myself included, once called a hero. Sephiroth. He's insane. And he's after something so powerful, he could destroy the planet unless we stop him. I see. Then uh, I have one more sin to atone for. The room is unlocked. Use it as you see fit. Mr. Murasaki. Don't mind if we do, I guess. Eric's like, that, was that a vampire? Yeah, I think if we had said Shinra, it probably would have played out similarly. But if we said Wu Tai, that would have been interesting. Probably would have at least made Yuffie lose some date points or something. So, uh, Vincent seems different, but I don't know what it is. His design is pretty much the same as, like, Dirge. Um, his face looked a bit different, but that's just, you know, because it's a remake. Um... I freaking love, I love Kate Sith. Like, I feel like in the original, he was supposed to be comic relief, but he didn't really fit into that role very often. Very rarely did he really like crack a joke, you know, where it was like, he was supposed to be comic relief. Here, it's like just him being in the scene as comic relief. Just his animations and just the way that he acts is just so great. Like, it just is constant, like, funny without having to be funny, you know? 
Like it's if he was around cracking jokes, he'd get so annoying so fast. But it's not that he's cracking jokes. It's that he's just ironically funny. So it's amazing. It's like it's perfect. You know, just the way he acts, the way that he just kind of does his thing, regardless of what else is going on and stuff like, yeah, I mean, like Kate Sith has got to be the greatest upgrade of all the characters by far. They took a character that was like generally disliked and was supposed to do a certain role, but didn't really fit into it and was also kind of confusing and now made him genuinely funny, genuinely interesting and cute. And the mystery is actually now interesting. Like, I want to know if they're going to explain more about how he works or how it's going to be revealed to the party that it's Reeve, et cetera, et cetera. And he's also, like, very important. I mean, we're ba- this entire section, we've been following him. Um, so, like, he's way more important, too. So, yeah, like, just he is by far the greatest upgrade, which is awesome. Because I was, like, I was looking forward to him, but he's always been, like, my least favorite character. So I was looking forward to the other characters more, but now he's one of my favorites and is definitely like, like I said, the, the best upgrade in terms of the characters. Um, but anyways, yeah, like, so the voice for Vincent's definitely different, obviously, but it fits. I don't know what it is. Something feels not off, just different about Vincent. He kind of... He feels more like Advent Children Vincent than Dirge Vincent. So, like, Advent Children Vincent felt like he had evolved a bit and was more, like, talkative and had, like, a phone... (laughs) And was like, you know what I mean? Like, Advent Children Vincent made it seem like at one point he was just a straight vampire. And then he became more of a human by the time Advent Children happened. Whereas here, he just feels human. Like, he feels like a Turk. Who's just, you know... uh, Edgy. (laughs) He feels like an edgy Turk, you know? He doesn't protrude the feeling of vampire um other than obviously laying in the coffin but um yeah something about it's just it's just a little different he he feels like he's more human more human than human more human than human uh he feels more human off the bat instead of being like just a straight vampire and then later becoming more human. But we've only seen him for a second, so I'm not going to make any wild claims, but just pointing it out, like he does seem a bit different. Uh, so I think he said security because he wanted to let the party know that he was part of Shinra without telling them he was a Turk. Because later, he reveals that. So I think that was their way of saying, because in the original, we didn't even need to know that he was part of Shinra, right? But here, we needed to know that he was part of Shinra because Kate Sith asked him for the, um, the module thing. So we needed the party to know he's with Shinra, but we're keeping the secret that he was a Turk. So that's why I said he was security. That's what I gleaned from that. Because in the original, this was all completely optional, and you didn't, you weren't doing anything Shinra-related. You were just walking by. Here, though, we have the strict mission of finding a Shinra terminal, and so we needed him to let us know he was part of Shinra without spilling the beans that he was Turk. So that's why he said security to be vague in his edgy way ooh there it is now this looks exactly like it did in what was it crisis core 
Quote, my boy. Still got that key or maybe I'm just thinking about the demo. Never mind. I think I'm just thinking about the demo because we, we got in this room this. in the demo. Might I suggest a spot of recon? Yeah, I was I was peeking around this room in the demo. In the demo, this door was not open. Uh oh. I can't walk backwards. <laughs> I can only work I can only walk forward. I wanted to look around that room more. Where's this even going? I'm fine. Nearly there. second I thought he was actually going to remember the pro the experiment I don't recall giving you permission to go in there Oh it was an honest mistake we didn't mean any ah! <laughs> yeah. I'm taking this cat Trespassing, like you. Save it. I've had a pretty shit day. What a coincidence. So have I. Alright, now this is awesome. We get the fight Galleon Beast. Also, I loved the classic monster movie shadow thing. That was sweet. He's like a vampire, so they did like the old monster movie cliche of the shadow on the wall. There's more to me than meets the eye immediately dies. You okay? This is such a cooler way of like showing Vincent. Instead of should I not attack? Instead of being like Oh, I'll help you, you know. Oh, you're going after Hojo? Alright, I'm in. Shrouded in mystery, aside from his alleged profession of security guard, he has transformed into a creature of chaos. Inflicting enough damage or pressure and making him flinch during inner turmoil or chaotic consumption will make him easier to pressure. 
Oh, so I should attack when he does that. I love that he's using, like, his specific moves, too. Playing the game well enough for you, bud? You totally got a problem? Yeah. <laughs> you got a problem, go out and say it. Am I not good enough for you? Be careful. After you. Seven hundred damage. What if Vincent was in Bloodborne? I think he might be. I think he might actually be in Bloodborne. That was spooky. Just sudden Aerith face. Said about PG chat, or are we just memeing? He left. Oh, okay. Nothing was lost.
Dude, I love the fact that this fight doesn't screw around. I did not prepare for this fight. I just had whatever was on me and I'm paying for it. I use magic against somebody who does that. Five days a week, every week, if not more, for however many years now. And I've had maybe like two or three people over the course of thousands of people ever complain about that. But whenever we do like a big event where there's a lot of people here, we get the people in here that only watch Fortnite raid streams. Then they get like genuinely confused as to why I don't drop an F-bomb every other word. Because that's the only humor they understand. Like, he hasn't broken a monitor yet. What's going on? This isn't Twitch. Chuck stuff at you too. Oh. oh yeah, for sure. That I totally get that. It can be a bit confusing. Because I play games that aren't PG, but I keep my stream PG. But whenever people ask about that, I tell them, A, there's a bunch of people in my stream that have kids that like to watch, and then, but they can look at the game and say, oh, is this game appropriate for my kid? But they know that I myself will always be PG, so it's a really nice way for them to be like, oh, is this, you know, can, can my kids watch this episode of 4-8 Live with me? Or, you know, they, all they have to do is look at the game to decide whether or not they can watch it with their kids or not. They always know that I'm going to be PG. So that's one, number one. Number two, I have two boys who I would like to show my streams of any game that is PG in the future. In three, we do a lot of charity stuff, and I just like to be PG for the charity. I think it's better for so that I can kind of go with any charity I want, and I'm never going to have, like, an issue there. In four... I think that with forcing myself to be PG makes my content better because I'm not just angry video game nerd where I play the game and get mad and cuss. I have to actually be authentic and, you know, funny without doing the bare minimum humor of cuss equals funny. So I give them those four things and then they're like, oh, that makes sense. But. You get the occasional person that can't even stay in the chat long enough to ask that, and they just go, What? I can't say poop. I'm out of here. Because they're used to Fortnite streams. And, you know, to each his own. I'm not used to using the Pro Controller, so I keep accidentally pushing the button. You've never seen that before because no one buys the $300 controller. <laughs> Except me. Well, to be fair, it was given to me, but... I'm actually really glad I got this because it helps a lot with me on white runs. Is he 
doing? He's breaking things. Oh my god. Oh my god, Kitsu! Kitsu just got annihilated. That hit me? can have a non-PG stream and be funny. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying me personally, it forces me to think outside the box and actually have meaningful conversations and jokes instead of just the bare minimum of game bad me cuss. But game bad me cuss is still funny and there's plenty of streams that do that that are great. No shade on that just me personally, it forces me to do something different. I mean, obviously what I do has had no benefit to my stream, like, you know, it's not like I've done this for a living for like seven years, and I've, I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? I'm sure that guy that left has, like, a stream with 10 million followers. He knows exactly how a Twitch stream should be run. I'm just the idiot here. song. Are we fighting the final boss? That's what the song sounds like. I know your story. Vincent Valentine, former Kirk. Okay, there we go. Stumbled on your file in the company database. There's a reason you're alone in the dark down here. And that reason has something to do with Sephiroth. Am I right? That's none of your business. I only ask because you might want to come with us. I don't know whether Sephiroth is dead or alive or something in between. But I do know that if I stick with this lot, I'll find out one way or another. Is this how you want your story to end? Temple is. Let's not bother the man. We do? This is news to me. Hey, Space Cadet. Come on. <laughs> I should also I should also mention that whenever someone does curse in our stream, we always just time them out. We've never banned anyone for cursing in the stream on accident or on purpose unless they do it like a million times on purpose just to troll. So, like, that should be noted. I know that it's a rule that is, like, different 
So like we only time people out and we time them out for a second. So it's like if they're gonna go crazy, then that's their own fault because literally all we do is time people out. Anyways, uh, so that was interesting. I, like I said, I really love the new, like the, the idea here with Vincent. Um, not sure I really like exposing that he's a Turk and exposing that he doesn't like Sephiroth and all this stuff. Like why? I feel like the cool thing with Vincent is that he joins the team and we know nothing about him. You know, like he joined, like he, he's just like, wait, are you going after Sephiroth? And we're like, yeah. And he's like, all right, I'll join you. And we're like, well, he's super strong. So, you know, he'll help us, but he's mysterious. So we don't know what's going on with him. And then later we learn. So I feel like when does he say he's a Turk actually I'm trying to remember. I don't think it's right away. Does he? Okay, then I'm then I'm lost in the sauce. Maybe it's when he when he jumps back. Or does he say it in the first room? Should I look it up? I think it's when he when you're about to leave and he he jumps in and then he's like, I'm a former Turk, so I could be of use to you. I think is what he says. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well then, I mean, I guess there's not really any information other than Kate Sith saying, like, your past has something to do with Sephiroth. That's, like, the only piece of information that we didn't have in the original. So, I guess, I mean, and the fact that he can transform. But in the original, you know that as soon as you get a limit break for the first time. So, like, I, I do kind of miss that. But there's no way to do that in this game. But that is kind of a cool thing about the original is that you actually don't know he can transform until you use his limit for the first time, and then you're like, what the... You know, like, that's a cool moment. But you get the same thing here, where he suddenly turns into a monster and you have to fight him. Um, but yeah, I think... Uh, I think... Um, Vincent was done really well here. He's really cool and really interesting, and... You want to know more about him and why he's so powerful. The only thing that I guess is maybe a little weird is like how hurt he is. But like, I'm wondering how they go about Vincent in this game because he can't be invincible chaos vampire or else like that lowers the stakes of our whole party. So I, I'm kind of wondering if he's just straight up not invincible in this one. I think he's like... In, as invincible as like Cloud and Sephiroth where like they have the genes so like they can be severely injured and heal themselves that kind of like invincibility almost like a Wolverine style invincibility but it's not like in the original where it's like he's gonna live for a million years and he's a vampire and he's could be a thousand years old and etc etc um, so I'm kind of curious like are they even going to go the vampire route or are they just going to say like he's another experiment are they even going to go the he has the proto materia inside of him and he has chaos inside of him and he's a vampire and he's going to live 10,000 years and blah 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 or is he literally just going to be another Sephiroth clone because they could just do that they could just say he's another Sephiroth clone he's a really strong Sephiroth clone they just call it that you know because this is Remake. They can change it. Like, they don't have to stick with Dirge. They could completely change what he is. So. Sephiroth clone, yeah, is kind of like a bad term. Um, But, like, Genova experiment. Say that. He's another Genova experiment. Because he can't be a Sephiroth clone, technically. So, another Genova experiment. He would be like a Sephiroth clone if that term had existed before that, <laughs> I guess. It's complicated. Anything that has S-Gene is a Sephiroth clone. So I guess he doesn't have S-Gene. He just has Genova cells. So, yeah. I guess you couldn't say so much. So he's just another Genova project. He's another 
experiment. But regardless, yeah, like he could just be another Genova project, or he could be all powerful, like straight up Sephiroth power level. Because that's kind of what he is. Like he is kind of Sephiroth power level. He basically has the same thing done to him as Sephiroth had done to him, just not as a baby. So like, and then on top of that, he apparently was fused with the Proto-Materia. So you could even say he's on a higher power level than Sephiroth. Uh, in Dirge, it's kind of apparent actually that he is on a higher power level than Sephiroth. But like, I don't expect them to do that in this game because they're trying to make Sephiroth the ultimate evil as he should be. So like, you know, but just talking on like a nerd level, <laughs> technically, if they were to stick to the dirge lore, he would be like the ultimate life form. But I don't think they're going to even do it. Like, I, I think honestly, they're just going to stick with like OG and just be like, yeah, he's he's got Genova cells, so he's really strong and just leave it at that. And they might not even really go into like him being a vampire or I mean, he is in the coffin, but I mean, I don't know. He's literally in the coffin. So that gives me the interpretation that he's been laying in the coffin for however many, how many years is it? Isn't it like 20 years or something? 30? However old Sephiroth is. Years. So I'm getting the interpretation that he's been sitting in that coffin for 30 years. So like he is not aging and he doesn't need food. So like I think he's a vampire. <laughs> I think just him being in the coffin alone means vampire or some kind of monster. Um, so, but whether or not they literally say that, that's what I'm kind of curious. Are they literally going to say the word vampire? I don't think they will. I think it will just be he's another Genova experiment. But it sounds like we're going to go more into his history. You know, it's not going to be like in the original where it's just a flashback. I think we're going to get like a lot of really cool lore with Vincent. I think he's going to be like a main character with a lot of lore and he's going to explain a lot of Hojo stuff to us. So I'm very curious if Proto Materia even is mentioned. Are we going to get a Proto Materia? This is why he's so strong. Are they even going to talk about chaos? Are we going to get like the whole dirge lore thrown in? Or is it just going to be like, yeah, I got Genova cells. I think for the sake of remake, they should just stick to Genova cells and not even say the word proto materia and not even say the word chaos. Make his limit called chaos, but just leave it at that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I would, uh, do they, I, uh, no, I don't, they don't, they don't use the word vampire in OG for sure. Um, it's heavily, heavily hinted at, <laughs> but, um, like the in, yeah, like there, it's not in the in-game lore, he's not a vampire, like vampires don't exist. That's why I feel like, that, but again, this is remake, so like they could actually be like, yo, he's a vampire, like straight up Dracula, like this dude's Dracula, like they could. But like, I think it's just gonna stay as an implied thing, because that's the way it was in the original. Um, but like, Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be weird. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. The fact that he sleeps in a coffin and he's ageless was basically just like, okay, he's a vampire. But because no other vampires exist, then it's more of just a, he's a project that happened to create this thing that's very similar to what we say is a vampire. 
He's not like in lore of Empire. Yeah. And I mean, just look at him. Like, <laughs> Just look at this man. But yeah, I think that we'll just keep it implied, but I'm very curious about whether or not chaos gets thrown in the mix, or if that's just like, we keep that, or if they ever make a dirge remake or something. Would you mind a quick trip to the saucer? What? Why would we want to go there? We're gonna go on a date. To even set foot inside the temple, we'll need to get our hands on a relic called the Keystone. Trouble is, it's been missing for nigh on 20 years. So, any guesses as to where it was last seen? The gold saucer. I know, it's a stretch. No denying that. But it's the only lead I've got. Then let's follow it. We trust you. Guys. You do? Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, if we gotta. Once we're good, let's get a move on. Right. I was gonna say, it feels a bit. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Like. I don't, I don't know a good term. Like, I want to say lazy writing, but that's, like, way too... That That's not what I mean. <laughs> um, but, like, you could say that it's a bit of lazy writing that for the past, like, four things we've done, Kate Sith has kind of been a plot device. Like, everything that we do, it's just like, Kate Sith told us to do this, Kate Sith told us to do that. Um, but I feel like it works because of what's coming. If it happens the same way as it does in the original. Kate Sith leads us on this whole chase and then he ends up not being who we think he is. So, like, I think it'll work. But I do want to point out that, like, he's been kind of a plot device for a while now. And you could see that as a negative towards the writing. Because, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't want a single thing being your plot device for too long, but I think it works because, you know, we're about to go back and then things are going to happen. And so I just wanted to mention it. Well, that's the thing that's really cool about this game. You mentioned that, like, hopefully Vincent gets his own chapter in the third game. Every character gets, like, their own chapter, but also they're constantly getting their own moments. It's not just, here's the Barrett chapter, okay, now Barrett shuts up for the next forever. Like, a lot of the side quests go specific to different characters. A lot of the main quest stuff will suddenly have a moment for a specific character. Um, so it's really cool. 
Yeah, I mean, that's one thing you could even point out is better than the original, because in the original, you do kind of get each person's chapter, and then they kind of say nothing. They have little comments they'll say, but especially if they're not in your party, they just disappear. You know, like, um, especially the optional characters, but even a character like, I think probably the best example is Red 13. Red 13 gets all of Cosmo Canyon, and then if he's not in your party, what does he say for the rest of the game? Like, name me a Red 13 quote. <laughs> like, he says absolutely nothing the whole rest of the game. Um, if he's and he's if he's in your party, then he'll throw in comments and sometimes there'll be something interesting. But a lot of times it's just, uh, you know, reacting to things. So it's really cool how in this game, like you do a side quest and suddenly you're having some moment with like Barrett and Tifa, uh, being sad about Wedge, or you have a moment where Yuffie thinks about home or. You have a moment where Aerith thinks about Zack or like, you know, just these little moments that happen regardless of what's happening in the story. And then a lot of the main quest stuff, too, will suddenly have a moment with a character that you weren't expecting. Um, I was trying to think there was one in Cosmo Canyon that was cool. I forget. Oh, it was the, the moment with Aerith and the people all when she told everyone she was an ancient. And there was that like moment with Cloud and Aerith. Like, that was completely separate from Red 13 and Cosmo Canyon. But they had that there to, like, give Aerith a moment. So it's really cool. They all are so, feel so important. And, like, are always having their characters extended. We're not just sitting around waiting for Temple, for Aerith to have a moment. We're not just waiting around for Dine, for Barrett to start talking. You know what I mean? Like, they're always growing. Especially with Cloud. Like, we had that moment in the inn where Cloud talked to every single character and there was, like, a moment. He talked to Barrett and talked to him and then talked to Tifa and then talked to Aerith and then talked to Red 13. Like, those moments are really cool. What's this? And that's something that the original just couldn't do. Didn't have the ability to do or didn't have the time to do. Defying my boss to be here, because I've got a hunger that cannot be denied. Cloud, bring me the black materia. There was a weird thing there where his sword was going like through my sword because of the spikes. desire to see you has driven me on. That's what I get for redlining the old engine. All right, my friend, it's the final lap. So let's cut it one last time! He's mine! So... This whole game, I've been trying to figure out why Roche is here. Wonder if he's here to teach us how degradation works. I mean, that's a really long-winded, multiple game build-up just for him to teach us something that we kind of already know, but... <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> kind of seems like that's what it, we're doing here. There's got to be more to him than that, though. Wow, that was impressive. It's not messing around. He's 
suddenly suddenly gaming. Ow. That was a nice. Nah. Can I have Ronald, please? Thank you. Dragoon, dive. So you said? Much cooler fight than last time. He's here to talk about his pyramid scheme. I'm gonna throw on a cess. Stop saying things that you know are gonna get timed out. I would appreciate it. is huge. So this just says outright he was degradating. Okay, well, just so you know, it says right at the top of the screen what the rules are. It also says we've been spamming the rules thing in the chat every time you've been timed out. And it also says the rules down below. So please, it's just like any other Twitch stream. Every Twitch stream has rules. Also, when you go to chat, the rules pop up. So like. There's four different places where the rules are at. They all make it very clear what the rules are. So, I don't mean to be mean, but it's very obvious. I make it very clear what the rules are. And if, if you've watched my stuff before, you should know that you shouldn't come here and immediately tell me how to play. So, like, sorry, but... Thank <laughs> you. 
try something. Take it easy. I don't know it worked. I don't know it worked, guys. Wait. It's over. <laughs> uh oh. We got a code red. <laughs> Stop works on stagger in this game. It does in Remake 2, but a lot of bosses are immune to stop. Get in the business. There's no escaping the degradation, my friend. You can't seriously die here. No shot. He's not dead. Black materia. Dream on. That materia is mine. There's no escaping the degradation. That won't happen to you. Don't worry. Yeah, she's right. You're going to be just fine. Come on. The gilded saucer awaits. And the keystone. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Huh? Look. Supporters of the Shinra Resistance Committee. My name is Glenn Lodbrock, a representative of Wu Tai's interim government. The hour is upon us when we must rise up to confront tyranny. Mere days ago, Junon's cannon rang out. A message. A declaration by Shinra's new president that he, like his father before him, would rule by fear. What's more, we recently learned that he had sanctioned the development of living weapons grown within the Mako reactors that provide power to your homes. Alarmed, we decided to seek answers. And in accordance with the ceasefire treaty, our government sent officials to investigate. Shinra promised their full cooperation. But when our inspectors duly arrived, they were mercilessly slaughtered. The footage you are about to see was taken from inside one of the reactors. have our enemy's military might. Nevertheless, a righteous fury burns in each of our hearts. A fire that we may carry to Midgar. And there, 
together. Put the city of Mako and Misery to the torch! This is our answer, Rufus Shinra. We are ready to march. And to lead us. Wutai's commander, Viceroy Saru. Exactly is this Saruf? The invisible man? Regrettably, we have no intelligence to present at this time. <laughs> then you clearly aren't looking hard enough. Look harder. Ma'am. What about that Glenn? What's his name? Glenn Ladbrock, ma'am. Ex soldier. P0 class, a prototype. Fifteen years ago, he was sent to Rador on a geological survey, which ended in failure and led to his defection. <laughs> a spineless deserter nursing a grudge, then. Subsequently, Lotbrock took to the road, seeking to forge connections with others who shared his anti-Shinra sentiments. <laughs> if you mean avalanche, they're dead and buried. I'm afraid I do not, sir. The fall of the Republic triggered a spate of uprisings in the surrounding regions. We suspect the SRC is largely comprised of forces who were defeated during the unrest. Well, who could blame them? They fought against the Republic in the name of freedom. But when the smoke finally cleared, they found themselves under the heel of a new oppressor. Why, I'd be more surprised if they didn't hate us. <laughs> Pity about Saruf. Would be good to put a face to the name. The Ancient is en route to the temple as we speak. Pursuing her is our top priority. She will guide us to the promised land. One way or another. Hmm. Mm. Regarding the speech, sir, many will interpret it as a declaration of war. And given that it was a worldwide broadcast, it would be prudent to issue a response. I intend to make a statement. Sung, if you would. Sir. So, how exactly are we supposed to get back to the saucer? With all the mountains and valleys in between, definitely not on foot. It's just way too far. Thoughts, Ketsef? Hey, Cat! Thoughts? Huh? Um, well, you see... Look! Smoke! Maybe someone's trying to call for Sid? If so, let's hitch a ride. Breaking news at this hour. Breaking news at this hour. In response to last night's illegal... Breaking news, breaking news. 
President Rufus Shinra held an emergency press conference this morning. In it, the president denounced the SRC's claims as baseless propaganda and dismissed their alleged Mako reactor footage as a digital fabrication. The company has launched an investigation into the individual who delivered the address, as well as the nature of the organization he claims to represent. So, like... Hmm. I have several questions. So, first of all, it seems like... It seems like Rufus, like, lied to Glenn. Because I'm trying to remember that cutscene prior. I'm pretty sure he said, like, we don't care about the ancient. I'm doing, I'm doing my own thing now. I don't care about the ancient. And, like, back then I had said, like, oh, this is different. But maybe he was just lying. Because Glenn's the enemy. Because it does seem like they're very specifically set on her. I thought there was some... I'm pretty sure there was a line where he was like, I'm not worried about that. I'm focused on the new Shinra. I'm pretty sure. But again, he might have been lying. Yeah, or like didn't care about the promised land or something. He either said it to Cloud or said it to um, Glenn. But I remember he said something about something that went against original, like what seems like Rufus's actual plot. I believe he did still say like he wants to take care of Sephiroth, but yeah, right. So he so he either lied or changed his mind. But I'm I'm thinking he lied. And he's actually been after the promised land the whole time, which is interesting. Um, so, so what is going on with the Roche? Like, I can't believe, I can't believe we built up this character over two entire games just for him to become a cloak. I mean, it's a cool, like, it's a cool twist of fate. But, like, I just feel like there's got to be more for him. And maybe there is. But, like, if he just becomes, like, a goofball the rest of the game, like, when we get to Crater, if, he, if we just kind of see him walking along with the other ones and he's just kind of a joke for the rest of the game, like, I'm going to be sad. Because they built him up to be way more. It is kind of cool that they used him to kind of show degradation to us, but we kind of already knew that was a thing anyways. But... I'm glad he, like, did something. And I'm also glad that that fight was cool. Like, a lot better than the first one. The first one was good, too, but... Like, the two Roche fights were good, but yeah. I hope he does more than just that. Um... This whole degradation thing is really fascinating, too, because... This is another thing where I feel like this is Square Enix reaching out to the original audience and saying like you know hey hey final fantasy 7 fans you know what's going to happen here or do you so like as an original final fantasy fan all of us are saying like oh cloud won't degradate of course he won't he has s gene so like he won't degradate just like sephiroth doesn't degradate right but we don't know that for sure in Remake. Which is so interesting. So they bring it up to us, and they're like, and Tifa's like, don't worry, that's not going to happen to you. And as the audience, we're like, don't worry, Cloud, that's not going to happen to you. But it's Remake. It could happen. We don't know. So it's this really cool, like, you probably know what's going to happen being a fan, but you don't exactly know. And that's what I love about Remake. That's, that's what I love about Remake, is that it can take these things that we should know as a fan and give us this little, like, nudge of, like, but is it going to be that way? And obviously they're doing the same thing with Aerith, and they're doing the same thing with a lot of things. 
with Rufus, with a lot of characters where it's like, and like even like the scene where Barrett quote unquote died in remake, you know, all of this to show us like, we know what's going to happen, but do we, you know, so they can keep it a mystery. They can keep the story very close to the original, but in the same way they can throw mystery our way. So even if we're the biggest Final Fantasy seven giga fan of all time, we don't absolutely know what's going to happen, which is just really cool. It's really, really cool. Um, what do you mean there's no plot, big plot point changes? This, the president didn't even die in his chair. Come on. <laughs> but no, like, it, it is, it's really cool. And the whole marketing for this game was all based around that exact point. And that, that's why I'm bringing it up, because that was the whole marketing. That was all the marketing of this game was, are we going to change fate? what's going to happen, you know, all the all the little uh, catchphrases they threw in, defy destiny, all this stuff. So that's what they're going for, and it's working really well. And there's all these little things. It's not just Aerith. It's all these other little things, like with Cloud's degradation and with uh, Barrett and Dine, there was like a moment where it was like, is he going to come with us? Like, obviously it wasn't, but, you know. Just these little things thrown in where it's like, is it going to happen the same exact way? You know, it's very, very cool. Very, very cool stuff. And I love that they continue to do this and it makes it fun to be a Final Fantasy VII fan. It makes it so much more awesome to play through this game. Like that moment, that moment where uh, Red 13 was howling at Seto and then suddenly Gene Attack appeared. Like, that was such a great moment to be a Final Fantasy VII fan, because it's like, I know what this is, but I don't know where they're going with it. And I could be the biggest Final Fantasy VII super fan on the planet, and there's no way for me to know exactly what's about to happen. This is, we're on, we're on, you know. And, and looking back on it now, you wouldn't say that that was necessarily a huge plot change. But in the moment, I was like, what's going to happen? You know? We have no idea what's about to happen. This is we're in we're in uncharted territory here, you know, but then in the end, it was really just an excuse to get us to the temple. So like the actual plot didn't change a lot, but it's those little moments where it's like, what's going to happen, you know, and then now they're throwing in this degradation thing where it's like, yeah, cloud shouldn't degradate given what we know about Final Fantasy seven, but maybe it happens or maybe it doesn't happen but cloud thinks it's happening and that causes certain things to happen so it's just really awesome just all the things that this game has done to continue that idea of defy fate change the history but also not change the history it's just really cool so um i think that's all i had to say i need to rewatch that scene i was like kind of distracted during it so i might have missed something um, so I might rewatch that, that scene we just watched again, but, um, I, I missed the, the ninjas getting attacked if there was some, like, very obvious, like, they weren't fighting back or something, <laughs> or there was, like, if there was something going on with that, I missed it, um, but, uh, they just got shot. I'm curious, like, if there's some kind of little hint there as to whether or not it was a staged thing or not. So I'll have to go back and look and see. But really interesting scene. Um, and yeah, where are they going with this Wu Tai stuff? That's also awesome because that's all new and added. But you know, just on top of everything else, it's like where are we going with all this Yuffie stuff? So very, very cool. Well, I want to thank you all so much for all the discussion today and for hanging out today. I really appreciate it. Thanks to the YouTube peeps as well. We're going to say goodbye to YouTube. So, YouTube, thank you so much for watching. Let's play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Love you. Thank you so much for the support. And we will catch you in the next episodes. Peace.